She thought she'd found her perfect man. But Kirsty Wilkinson married her murderer. Just months after the wedding, her battered body is found crammed into a suitcase, thrown from a motorway bridge. Police arrest her husband and uncover a secret hell of drugs, violence and prostitution. Kirsty was two people. As soon as she'd finished her shift in the parlour, she became the girl next door. This is one of the biggest cases that I've ever worked on. And talking to South Wales Police, you just really got a feel of the magnitude of this case. Excessive use of violence beyond what was necessary. I just grabbed the phone and I was phoning people and shouting through the phone, cursed is dead, cursed is dead. Kirsty Wilkinson was born on the 19th of June, 1984, the youngest of three sisters. Hi, Leslie. From a young age, Kirsty enjoys a particularly close bond with her mother, Kathy. When I gave birth to her and the nurses told me it was a little girl, I cried my eyes out. They said, oh, was it your first girl? I said, oh, no, my third. I was just so happy to have another girl. I was over the moon. When Kirsty is 14, the family moved to Bridgend, South Wales. We were very, very close. We were a lot alike in many ways. She had a lot of my mannerisms. Even people tell me that now. They say, oh, the way you just done your shoulders and you just reminded me of Kirsty. Kirsty's dream is to follow in the footsteps of her idol, Jordan, and make it as a top model. If you'd walk down the street with Kirsty, you know, they would turn to look at Kirsty because she was just, you know, gorgeous. She started glamour modelling. She was doing quite well. As she grows up, it appears to her family that Kirsty is living the dream. Then, at the age of 23, she calls her mum, Kathy. She phoned me and she says, Mum, I'm getting married. I says, what do you mean you're getting married? She says, I've met somebody called Paul. I says, what do you mean you've met somebody called Paul and you're getting married, you know? She says, oh, we're getting married in five weeks. I says, hang on a minute. I says, I don't even know him. Where did you meet him and all this? She says, I went to a party and he was there. She says, we had a one night stand. And she says, I recognised him and he sort of recognised me. And it clicked that, that, that they had met each other before. As far as Kirsty is concerned, she has met the man of her dreams. But who is Paul Grabham? Forensic psychologist Dr. Kerry Nixon works with Merseyside Police, profiling serious violent offenders and has done research into this case. He didn't do very well at school. Um, he had a poor education and he was always getting in trouble. So we can see here that there's general antisocial traits in his background. Heidi Maloney was Paul Grabham's neighbour years before he met Kirsty. In my eyes, he was a loner, but he still wanted to be noticed, if you know what I mean. Very strange, strange boy. But 23-year-old Kirsty has fallen in love with Grabham and wants to settle down and start a family. All she wanted in the world was just have a little baby and just have a little family. That's all she wanted. Kirsty's heart is set on sharing her life with Paul Grabham. But a family can't see the attraction. My first impressions was, what the hell is that? He was scruffy, unkempt, he had bad teeth. When I met him, he just seemed a bit of a jack the lad. I just couldn't see what Kirsty would, you know, seen in him. He was a professional chef. He was a plumber. He was a mechanic. He was a sports car driver. And he was a male stripper and various other things. His behaviour is very narcissistic, uh, very um, making up things about how much money he earns, jobs that he can do. It's, he's very egocentric and wants people to think of him in ways that is, is not true. It's an image that he's portraying that is not based in fact. Paul Grabham fails to impress Kirsty's family and they are unaware of the threat he poses to women. Heidi Maloney was attacked by him and lives with the fear to this day. 
he was complaining that we had done damage to his car. And later that day, when Heidi is driving home, she runs into a roadblock. And Paul Grabham was one of them with a baseball bat. And we went one way. Grabham then tries to run Heidi off the road. What I thought was bushes. Behind them bushes was brick wall and we went straight into it. I was scared of him for a long time. I moved out to the area and I haven't looked back. Although Kirsty's mother is unaware of Grabham's past, she has a bad feeling about Grabham and tries to persuade her daughter to postpone the wedding. I says, why don't you wait till even about June to get married? Just get to know him a bit more. I know you've met him before, but I says, you didn't know him for very long. But she wasn't having any of it. She says, no, Mum, I'm going to get married. Psychologist Emma Kenny has been looking into this case using her experience of dealing with victims of familial crime. Kirsty wanted the dream. She wanted the pink limo, she wanted the bigger wedding. It was almost like she was playing out a romantic fantasy, a whirlwind, a Hollywood experience, very much in keeping with her ideas about what she wanted for her own life as a glamour model. On the morning of her wedding, just five weeks after the start of their relationship, Kirsty is planning a surprise for Grabham. She says, um, I'm going to say, when they say you take this man to be your lawful wedded husband, I'm going to go, no, <laughs> like this, you know. When Kirsty's pink limousine pulls up outside the registry office, two fantasy worlds are firmly on a collision course. Kirsty and her vision of married bliss, and Paul, who is not all he seems. Paul William Grabham. Well, Paul William Grabham. May not be joined in matrimony. May not be joined in matrimony. I was filming it in the register office, and when it came to that part, she looked at me and I looked at her, and there was a little secret smile between us because of what we had been talking about. You can actually see that in the video. Take me, to take me, Paul William Grabham. Paul William Grabham. To be my lawful wedded husband. To be my lawful wedded husband. I knew in my heart, because I had such a strong bond and a connection with Kirsty, I knew this wasn't going to last. The sign of my love. The sign of my love. This is Kirsty's wedding video. This is the first time I've been able to look at it what she was walking into was her death. It wasn't a marriage of love, it was a marriage of death. <laughs> Paul and Kirsty are now man and wife, but in the weeks and months following the wedding, cracks start to appear in their marriage. So we got married to her very quickly. He was taking over control of her life. He, you know, he had access to her money. He controlled her body. And by marrying her, in his eyes, he was controlling her life as well. In Paul Grabham, Kirsty feels she's met a man who understands her and accepts her for who she is. But their marriage was not to be a happy ever after fairy tale, as behind closed doors lay dark taboos, drugs, violence, and prostitution. And as soon as she'd finished her shift in the parlour, she became the girl next door. He becomes the parasite and she becomes the feeder. He had her hands around her throat and said um, she couldn't breathe and she said she thought she was going to die. And she said she was that scared. She goes, I'll wet, I'll, I'll wet myself. I said, Baby, will end up killing you and you'll be found in a ditch somewhere. <laughs> That's never a true word spoken. Kirsty Wilkinson enjoyed a whirlwind romance with Paul Grabham, but the fairy tale is about to turn into a nightmare. Kirsty's family and friends had begged her not to marry Paul Grabham, but for Kirsty, there is no turning back. 
We were introduced into Kirsty's world because she kept a diary. And in fact, New Year 2010, she makes a very poignant statement about her and her husband against the world. Again, there is this romantic notion that somehow they are lovers who are fighting a battle that they will win. And in many ways, it feels that the relationship that she was experiencing was an entirely different relationship from the reality. Kirsty and Paul are not a conventional couple. They both work as escorts, advertising themselves for sex on the internet. According to Grabham, Kirsty lied to her family about where she'd met her husband. The truth is, Kirsty had a one-night stand with him in 2004, then met him again five years later at the brothel in Bridge End where she worked. Amateur photographer and personal friend Martin Richards had been taking photos of Kirsty for adult magazines for years. It seems as if they had met in the parlour. I think she wanted somebody that would accept what she did and knew what she did. And by them meeting again in the parlour, he knew what she did. So she didn't have that in the back of her mind, you know, or oh, I'm hiding this from him. He knows all about it, you know. It seems Kirsty was ashamed to reveal the truth to her family. If she did say she was in the parlour, she was working the reception. You know, she was on the desk answering the phones and that sort of thing. Never that she was a working girl. Because uh, she obviously was embarrassed to tell somebody that she loved that she, that's what she was doing. What I found was that Kirsty was two people. There was the work inside where she worked in the parlour. And as soon as she'd finished her shift in the parlour, she became the girl next door. It, you know, it was purely a job and a way of making money. And in Paul Grabham, Kirsty believes she has someone who loves her for who she is. Or so she thought. The more I could see of the relationship, the more he was being a parasite, a leech. You know, I mean, the more she did, it meant the more money he was having. Grabham encourages Kirsty to have sex for money. He sets up websites, he encourages punters to come, he even attends the brothel with her to make sure that she makes appointments, all the while disinterested in her and her needs, but interested in the money that she gains for him. Remember, Kirsty wants to make him happy, right or wrong, she's committed to this man, she's married this man, she feels that she must love this man because otherwise why should be acting this way? And so, he becomes the parasite and she becomes the feeder. It is clear from Kirsty's diaries that her career as a prostitute is not a life she wants anymore. How can Paul really truly love me if he wouldn't mind seeing another man touch me? I don't want it. It makes me so sick to think about it. She wanted to get out of the life and settle down and be a mum because she would have made a great mum. She's fallen in love with this guy and she just wants to be loved. And probably when, prior to meeting him, when she was working at the brothel, she is probably a stereotypical, uh, confused young girl who was involved in something that she didn't really want to be involved in. And she just wanted um, the knight in shining armour to come and sweep her off the feet and make and live happily ever after. In her diaries, Kirsty asks Grabham why he wants to see her sleeping with other men and women. Getting her to have sex with other people is part of his power and control over it. It is something that we see in domestic abuse situations, but also forcing somebody to have sex with other people or to have sex in front of other people. Him making her do that would then potentially give him ammunition to further attack her. Just a few months into her marriage on a night out, Kirsty confides in her sister that her husband has been violent towards her. She said um, she was in the bedroom, we'd pushed her back onto the bed 
And then he was sitting on the stomach and he had her hands around her throat and said um, she couldn't breathe and she said she thought she was going to die. And she said she was that scared. She goes, I bet myself. She said, because I was petrified. She goes, I thought it was going to kill me. Pinning somebody down on the bed and strangling them um, is a very aggressive act. And to be able to do that, to place your hands around somebody's throat and strangle them and pin them down, also to the degree where they then wet themselves, is very controlling and very high risk. That's not love. She was scared. She was scared of him. Kirsty documents her fears in her diary. I know that is not right. It shouldn't be like that. Sometimes I am petrified because I don't know what you're going to do or say next. When Cathy finds out about the violence, she pleads with her daughter. And I says, oh, Kirsty, you need to get away from him, babe. You really, really have to. I says, he sounds so dangerous. I says, Bobby will end up killing you and you'll be found in a ditch somewhere. <laughs> That's never a true word spoken. According to forensic psychologist Dr. Kerry Nixon, violent offenders rarely start their domestic abuse with strangulation. It is my belief that there would have been previous incidents before, prior to that. That is a very extreme level of violence for it to be the first incident of violence. I think that's probably the first time she shared violence with anybody else in terms of telling them about it. In another example of Grabham's dark side, he keeps a morbid collection of dolls upstairs in his attic. Dolls in coffins. Why a grown man would have something like them just bewilders me. Also, the likes of this toy, this, this neck being held. 25-year-old man keeping dolls that are violent in nature um, is unusual and is, is indicative of his, of his violence and maybe his obsession with violence. The fact that he has these dolls um, of such a violent nature, of strangulation, coffins, etc., uh, shows that he has a fascination with an extreme form of violence. Another toy, obviously blood. Violence, portraying violence, cutting people. To me, they're just the toys of a psychopath that is, loves death and the idea of strangling. So God knows what was going through his mind when he put his hands around my little girl's neck. Kirsty and Grabham are both recreational users of cocaine. But Kirsty is desperate for a baby and wants to put an end to their partying lifestyle. In one letter that I read, she says, she was saying to Grabham, please, if you're really serious, as serious as I am about starting a family and trying for a baby, you'll stop taking that stuff, which I presume meant drugs. The problems in her marriage are pushing Kirsty to breaking point. I said to Bob, are you all right? You're just not your normal self. I said, you, you're looking awful. She says, you know something, Mum? She says, uh, you and Dad are always right. And you know something now? I'm going to start listening to you. And to me, that meant that she was going to finish with him. She was going to walk out on that marriage. She was going to leave him. Although both work as escorts, they live by different rules. It's obvious that he was the one with the power here. She had boundaries in terms of what they were able to do sexually with other people, whereas he would go outside of those boundaries. To her, to, to her it was cheating. He had no such boundaries and was willing to do whatever he wanted sexually with, with whoever he wanted. An insecure Kirsty's worst fears are about to become reality. She discovers her husband is using the internet to have sex with other women. For Kirsty, it's the ultimate betrayal. He was arranging to meet up with um, girls saying he was single. 
And then she just kept on saying, why would they do that to me, son? Why would they do that to me? When I asked how she was, she said she was leaving Paul because he'd been on dogging websites and he cheated on her. Um, she was sick of his lies. He was just controlling her and she'd had enough. He thinks he's some sexual stud, whereas actually he's some violent obsessive who abuses his wife. Kirsty is making plans to walk out on Grabham for good. I've been to the bus station, she said, and to go, I want to go to Coventry. She seems determined to move away from this life and make a fresh start. She planned to come to stay with me. We were going to go out and have a girly night. Um, she just never got the chance to. Tragically, she never makes it to Coventry. Her last chance to escape Grabham has gone. Despite her family's heartfelt pleas, Kirsty gets back with Grabham. I phoned her up and she just, I said, oh. I said, she didn't, weren't speaking much on the phone. And I said, you're back with him, aren't you? And she said, well, she wouldn't answer me. And I said, you are, aren't you? I said, you're stupid. I said, why are you back with him? After what he's done. A few days later, Kirsty and Paul have a night out in Swansea. They have a row, and Kirsty tells Paul to go home. Paul goes back to the flat, and later that night, Kirsty returns home. She is never seen or heard from again. The last words Kirsty ever says to me because she knew I was going to bingo was, do you want some of my luck? And that's the last words I ever heard from my little girl. When you go to the car, you, you look like a film star. He uses her credit cards, withdraws money, and pays for a prostitute with her money. Your body had been found. I thought, I can't be Kirsty. And they came and they said, we have arrested Grabham on suspicion of murder. Almost a year to the day after her fairy tale wedding to Paul Grabham, Kirsty has gone missing. She is last seen on Friday, 27th of March, 2009, by the taxi driver who dropped her home after a night out clubbing. On this Sunday, I tried to phone and I sent her a text. There was no answer and I started getting a bit worried then. I said, today something's wrong. I said, I'm gonna to phone tomorrow. On the Sunday, Grabham calls Kirsty's friend, Martin Richards. And he said, do you know where Kirsty is? And I said, no, why was happening? He said, oh, she's, uh, we've had an argument and she's come back to the flat, picked a few things up and she's gone. And I said, well, you must have had a real ding-dong argument, I said, you know, for her to pack some things. The next morning, there was an early phone call from Grabham. And he says, hi, Cathy. He says, uh, have you seen Kirsty? I says, no, I haven't, Paul. I says, no, I haven't heard from her. Do you know, I says, if he's been arguing? And he said, no. But Grabham's story doesn't ring true. Kirsty's sudden disappearance is out of character, and Cathy is suspicious. And I says to him, well, you better phone the police and report her missing, which he did, but I wasn't sure. So I phoned the police myself, and I explained to them that he had tried to strangle Kirsty before. Kirsty's sister, Sonia, senses all is not as it seems, and calls Grabham herself. And that Paul said, oh, um, Kirsty's um, took stuff from the flat. Um, there was, like, washing that had been ironed and was folded up on the bed, and I thought, well, that wouldn't be Kirsty having, you know, ironed, folded up clothes on the bed. She'd normally just throw them in a wardrobe, you know, so I thought that was strange. Um, she took hair straighteners, but not a hairbrush. Um, she took money, but not a cash card. Just things didn't add up, what he was saying. 
I'd been constantly sending her texts, but unbeknown to me, Grabham had cursed his phone in his pocket all the time, reading everything that I had been sending. While Grabham is playing the role of concerned husband to Kirsty's family, he continues his party lifestyle of drugs and casual sex. Another friend of Kirsty's that she'd been out with that night had said that her mum had found out the flat and he was having a party apparently. Because she could hear people in the background. Grabham continues to carry on with his partying lifestyle, which shows very little respect for Kirsty. He returns to their home, um, he uses her credit card, withdraws money and pays for a prostitute with her money. Grabham visits a massage parlour, then trawls sex websites on the internet looking for casual sex. He says he is single and travels round in Kirsty's Jeep, having sex with young women in the Bridgend area. One of the women he gets in contact with is the daughter of the neighbour he had previously threatened, Heidi Maloney. Paul did get in touch with my daughter, and I think it was through Facebook. And I think when he got in touch with my daughter, it would have been only sex as well. Thankfully, and luckily, she had enough sense to say no. It shows very uh, antisocial personality traits. And he's very narcissistic in that it's all about him, what he wants. He carried on with what he wanted with very little thought to what had happened to Kirsty and to what her family were going through. While Kirsty is missing, South Wales Police launch a huge investigation, interviewing hundreds of people who knew her. A week after Kirsty's disappearance, a concerned Martin arranges to meet up with Grabham, and it appears he has been decorating their flat. So I sat on a settee and I looked up and I could see this painted area on the ceiling. And I said, what the fucking hell is that? And he said, oh, he said, I started painting it for Kirsty, and she didn't like the color, so I stopped. I didn't think anything of it, because it made sense, you know. Then Martin realises there's something missing from the flat. Well, the, the black fun fur rug is gone that the cat played on, you know. That was missing. Uh, so I asked him, I said, have you heard anything? No, nothing at all, he said, nothing at all. Martin makes a statement to the police about the painting in the flat. Then a breakthrough in the investigation. The police found out that Kirsty had tried to make a 999 call, which didn't connect, and that's when they became suspicious. The evidence is stacking up against Grabham, and the police have news for Cathy. They came and they says, we have arrested Grabham on suspicion of murder. But Grabham refuses to talk. The police says he didn't cooperate at all then. He was um, just saying no comment to every question. The police are getting no change from Grabham while the search for Kirsty continues. And then, eight days after her beloved daughter went missing, the police come and see Cathy with devastating news. This is uh, the body of a young lady has been found in a field. Of course, I just, I just went hysterical then. I just grabbed the phone and I was phoning people and shouting through the phone, cursed is dead, cursed is dead. I'd had the message come back to me that mum had found, apparently a body had been found. Um, and I thought, wow, I thought it can't be Kirsty, because there was another woman that had gone missing around that time. So I thought, oh, maybe it's her. And I thought, there's no way it can be Kirsty. On the way there, on the motorway, there was just all like reporters on the bridge, just by the M4. And it was all taped off and we could see police there. And then 
you know, got to my mum's house and she was just slumped in the corner, just screaming. She was just screaming for Kirsty. Kirsty's body is found in a small suitcase next to the M4, just a few miles from Mum Cathy's home. A lorry driver stopped. We happened to see a black bit of a suitcase, which was rather bulgy, and he opened it. The first thing he seen was a hand. And see, I don't know till this day if Kirsty was still alive in that suitcase. It's every parent's worst nightmare. Kathy has to identify Kirsty's battered body. When I seen her, she was, um, she had two purple swollen eyes. You couldn't even see her eyelashes. She had black eyes, fingerprints on her cheeks, where she'd been grabbed. Her nose was all grazed, jaw was broken, scratches everywhere, all over her face. She looked like a monster. There was blood in her hair still, even after it had been washed. Didn't look like Kirsty. She was absolutely beaten beyond recognition. I just couldn't take it in that it was Kirsty. I gave her a kiss on the forehead, then I kissed her on her right cheek and went outside the mortuary. I went back in to say goodbye. And then she said, son, give your sister a kiss. I said, I can't. I said, I can't give her a kiss. She, she terrifies me. I said, just look at her. And I think about what she must have went through that night. Was she shouting for her mum? Which I imagine she would do. Meanwhile, Paul Grabham attends Swansea Magistrates Court, charged with Kirsty's murder. I was outside when Paul Grabham was led in by an officer in handcuffs. He was very quiet, he didn't speak to anyone. There were lots of cameras going off in his face. He just kept looking steely, steely face and, and walked into the magistrate's court. Inside, that's when we discovered that it was Kirsty's husband that was actually in court for her murder. And that really set the scene then for what was gonna be a huge murder investigation, a huge trial. Kathy and the family have to organize the funeral with some strict instructions from Kirsty herself. In Kirsty's diary, there's a really harrowing prediction. She actually writes a funeral list of 10 things that she wants to happen at her funeral. And you can't help but imagine that when she did that, she had some kind of understanding that the situation she was in could actually lead to her death. Number one, my coffin, pink. Number two, pink flowers. Number three, my wedding and engagement ring to come off. From wanting her engagement and wedding ring to be removed through to the pink curse, she was going to do it on her terms. She didn't get to control very much in her life, but she certainly got to control the way that she was sent out from this world. So she, for a young girl at 24 years of age to write that, she must have known what he was going to do to her. Hello, the husband of Swansea model Kirsty Grabham has appeared in court today, charged with her murder. The mark on the back where he had tried to cut her in half. A excessive use of violence uh, beyond what was necessary. He had such a high opinion of himself that he thought he'd, he'd get away with it. Their marriage lasted barely a year. Now in February 2010, Paul Grabham is facing trial for the brutal murder of his wife, Kirsty. Hello, the husband of Swansea model Kirsty Grabham has appeared in court today charged with her murder. 
This is one of the biggest cases that I've ever worked on. And talking to South Wales Police, you just really got a feel of the magnitude of this case. One of the officers told me that they'd spoken to over 600 people because right from the start, they felt that Paul Grabham's account of things didn't really add up. While the murder trial is headline news, in court, Grabham appears disinterested. Grabham didn't show any remorse for killing Kirsty, and he doesn't appear to be sorry. He had such a high opinion of himself that he thought he'd, he'd get away with it. I hate you, you bastard. I want to fucking kill you. That's how I've... That's what I thought. I want to kill you. You've killed my little girl. The court hears how in the early hours of Saturday, March the 28th, 2009, Grabham murdered his wife, Kirsty in their flat. Paul and Kirsty had been out in a nightclub in Swansea, but as usual for the couple, they started to argue, and the court heard that he'd said she was doing his head in, and he left and went home. She continued partying with her friends, and then in the early hours of the morning, returned to their flat in Swansea. He was high risk, a high risk offender, which means there was potential for him killing Kirsty at any point. On the night in question, Grabham and Kirsty had both taken cocaine. However, the dysfunctional factors in relation to the alcohol, the drug use, um, the excessive paranoia, probably uh, caused by the excessive drug use, led to the murder on that particular night. I got back to the flat in the early hours of Saturday morning. So it seems like he'd dragged her from the bedroom and hit her over the head with an instrument splitting a head open and uh, he smashed the face to pieces beyond recognition, broke her nose and strangled her. That's when neighbours started hearing shouting and screaming from upstairs and then a really high pitched scream as if someone was being strangled and that's what was happening in the flat above them. Excessive use of violence. Uh, beyond what was necessary, shows um, what he was thinking about Kirsty that night and the lack of respect he had for her and how he felt about Kirsty. Then he just decided to put her in a little suitcase. Uh, probably had a few attempts at trying to get her in and thought the best way to do it is to cut her in half. There was a mark on the back where he had tried to cut her in half, but it was, he probably realised it was going to be too messy and too much of a job for him. Then, while she was still warm, callously and coldly, just folded her into a suitcase. Now, we were shown that suitcase in court. It was really small. He must have stuffed her body inside it. Grabham then drags the suitcase, with Kirsty's body inside, down the stairwell of their flat, before putting it in the boot of Kirsty's car. And he just threw her away from the M4 onto an embankment, hoping that she would never be found. The court hears that when Grabham returns to the flat, it's covered in blood. The blood was on the ceiling where he had, that's where he had painted it over. Is that he would cover in the, the splash of blood. The DNA evidence was damning. Blood stains were found on a mop and bucket used to clean the flat after the murder. I've been through quite a few domestic murder trials where the person's been saying not guilty, um, thinking that they can get away with it, thinking that the evidence is circumstantial. Um, so he, he probably thought he could get away with it. Kirsty's family think Grabham may have looked through his wedding photos after he killed Kirsty. When I seen the fingerprint, I just thought, is that my daughter's blood? Was he looking through this after he murdered my daughter? Was she there? Was she in the suitcase by that time? Was he sitting surrounded by Kirsty's blood? Nobody will ever know. I'll never know the answer to that, will I? Grabham claims to have been asleep on the sofa at the time of the murder. 
his defence was laughable. I think you'd have to be uh, in an induced coma not to wake. After hearing Grabham's evidence, Cathy can take no more. Got up from where I was sitting and I just walked slowly over. I stood right in front of him and I said, I hope you're happy with yourself. And I just walked out of the court and broke down. On the 4th of February, 2010, the jury retire to consider their verdict. Often in murder cases, they'll take a long time, but just five hours after the jury went out, they came back to court and said that they had a unanimous decision that Paul Grabham was guilty of murdering his wife. The judge gave him a life sentence and ordered him to serve a minimum of 19 years. For Dr. Kerry Nixon, Grabham killing Kirsty was his final act of betrayal. This marriage between Kirsty and Graham was, was based on deceit and control and abuse from the beginning. He abused um, Kirsty's vulnerability. He abused her trust and love in him. She wanted a better life. She wanted her life to change. And she really thought that she was marrying to have children and to live happily ever after. He never intended to give her what she wanted. He betrayed Kirsty in such a massive way. It's such, such a severe impact on all my family for the rest of our lives. I have to go to a graveyard and I'd see my sister, you know, I can't go to a house. You know, I have to go to a headstone. And when I go up there, um, my little daughter, who's only five, says to me, why, why does mommy always cry in God's garden? And then she says, can God not bring going to Kirsty back? And then, you know. I miss her like you just, like nobody could imagine. Evil, brutal, selfish, cold-hearted, no feelings whatsoever, no heart, he's heartless. With the loving support of husband Dave, Kathy is determined Kirsty's death will leave a lasting legacy. She's got involved in a campaign which gives her focus to help her deal with her devastating loss. Somebody commits murder, they should spend the rest of their lives in jail. People like Grabham should never ever be allowed to walk our streets again. Kathy will never give up. She's getting strength in my eyes from Kirsty. I know she'll be looking down on me and telling me, you go for it, Mum. Do it, Mama. Do it, Big Mama. That's what she used to call me, Big Mama. <laughs> um, it does help me. It helps me a lot. It gives me something to focus on. A bit of hope. Kathy and Sonia want to set the record straight about the kind of person Kirsty was, their pink princess. I mean, that was my sister at the end of the day. You know, I mean, headlines, um, prostitute murdered. I mean, and she had a name, her name was Kirsty. Kirsty should be remembered for the beautiful, kind-hearted, unselfish person that she was. She's my little girl, she's my princess. And I love her so, so much. <laughs>